Hello, ghouls and goblins, and welcome back to an extreme version of Bride of Alternate Ending. It's flavor blasted with 1993 power. If you listen, your ears will turn into uh, stalks of corn or something and shoot off your heads, because this is a commercial from the 90s. I, I knew exactly what you were doing until you talked about corn shooting out of your head. I was like, I don't know what 90 signifiers you're thinking of there okay well i'm actually i think i probably conflated a little bit of early 2000s of what i was watching as a kid which is uh if you drink a capri sun you turn into basically the silver surfer and start kind of like sloshing around the world oh, okay um and then if you eat gushers your head turns into a big piece of fruit it does yes so basically a lot of the the premier fruit treats of the time were kind of advertising uh that by eating their product, you could step into like a Cronenbergian world of of pure body horror. Which, when you think about it, that is a very good way to sell children food. Oh, for sure, <laughs> very much. I'm, I'm just. It definitely. I was. It definitely led to a lot of disappointment. Oh, of course, I, I yeah. Because because but... then you you eat gushers and you're like, these are just terrible jelly candy with even worse like liquefied sugar goo inside of them. Yeah, I mean, it is basically the stuff. So I don't know that they were necessarily misadvertising, <laughs> um, but the the specifics were off. They were definitely. They were. But no, we did flavor blast things in the '90s, uh, and and flavor blasting is is one way we could describe the movie we have today, or or perhaps in need I'm... of flavor blasting is something we. Could... Yeah, in in some ways, I I mean, uh, first of all, you are Tim Brayton. Welcome, Tim. I am I think Tim I didn't, Brayton. I didn't introduce I am, either. You of us. didn't. I I immediately fine. did what I do, which was try to break things, and I feel good about that because that is what I, Tim Brayton, co-ghost of this podcast, like to do. Yeah, and I think that uh, 1993, the the height of Nirvana's fame, I think they would appreciate. Uh, you stepping into I, just kind of I, I think so. I mean, I'm day. wearing uh, currently a plaid, and it's not flannel, but it's sort of in the the oof, not the oof, but like the the neighborhood of flannel. It is it is flannel adjacent, so I'm sort of rock and grunge. Yeah, I I I, I, I honor your commitment to to the bit. Uh, the the bit yes, of so... being an adult male in the state of Wisconsin. Yeah, no, that I've, I've I've heard I've heard tales I've heard the legends and they seem to be true. Um, but yes, so this is a new month. It is April. Happy April, everyone! I hear there's showers. Take take lots there, of them. I there's, don't know. It's showering right now. In fact, in, in oh, congratulations! Wisconsin. Yes. Uh, we we had a bit of rain yesterday, which was March rain. I don't know what that's supposed to do, but it did kind of scrub the sky well, a little bit. You can actually see the LA skyline for well, once. It doesn't giving... look there's a big fart cloud around. Now it. you're giving the the game away you're indicating that we're recording on april 1st and not whatever day the podcast goes live so it's everyone knows that this is canned and fake and we're not uh, we're not april fools we're not everyone actually your, your <laughs> podcast friends who are having this conversation right now right now we're inside your phone or perhaps in your car perhaps in your laptop wherever you're listening to this podcast yeah and perhaps our my head is a giant bunch of grapes you just don't know um, the world is full of lies. Um, but anyway, this month we are hotly anticipating the first Omen and the ballerina vampire movie, Abigail. Uh, and to tie in, we thought, we thought we'd do a little bit of a uh, killer kid mayhem on, on the podcast. Uh, the movie that the Patreon folks voted for us to cover first is 1993's The Good Son. They really got in early on the trend of calling things the good blank. Yes, um, yes did. So congrats to them. And and got, in, got to, in early yeah. on the '90s trend of irony because he is not a good son. <gasps> but, spoiler alert: he is a bad son. Or, Unless, in a different yeah, form of irony, son. is it the one who is not a son who is good? I guess we'll just have to find out. I guess out. we will. Um, 
But yes, no, this is this is not the latest The Good Wife spinoff. This is a that thing that was going on in the early nineties where you took a lifetime movie and you jazzed it up just a bit. Not a lot. But you gave it one or two scenes that were a little spicier than you were expecting. Yeah, you, you do just enough to push past network uh, standards and practices. You have just enough, like, oh, they actually, like, spent money to get the camera crew out to a location. So it feels just just a tiny soup saw above. Yes. Um, but, yeah, so this is I, – I would say this is in the same family as – Single white female, the hand that rocks the cradle, like that kind of oh, umbrella. Oh, absolutely, of... absolutely. No question this belongs to that same vibe of <clears throat> early 90s sort of domestic melodrama thriller. Which is, this is my where I operate at my peak, is is in this exact time period, exact subgenre, and I've never seen this movie, so I was excited that the, uh, the folks on the Patreon were kind enough to give us a movie that seemed interesting to me. Um... But anyway, shall we talk about what this movie's about? Uh, we should. We probably should. Um, it's the bad seed. There. I've, done, I mean, I've talked about the plot of what this movie's about. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, so <clears throat> I watched it longer ago than you did, so I think I should do the plot, and then you can yell at me for the details I've got. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> okay, so Elijah Wood plays a kid of who has a name. Don't know it. Don't remember. It doesn't matter. It's Elijah Wood. <laughs> His um, name is Mark. Mark. Oh Mark. yeah, because I, I feel like, I feel like the the his uh, his aunt kept calling him Mork. Um, she was very Canadian. She couldn't really bury the accent. She uh, she is indeed Wendy Crewson, who is a fine Canadian actress, but certainly a Canadian Canadian actress. Yeah, I I thought I recognized her and I I didn't, but it just turns out that that haircut definitely dated Chandler Bing at some point in the '90s. So it was just uh, it was tricking me into thinking I knew who she was. Okay. Um, but anyway, yeah. So Mark, uh, his his mo- his mother has passed of a hilariously maudlin movie illness, um, where she she gets to have a nice conversation with him where they're just talking at a whisper. Um, and you can't hear shit in this scene. Um, they are too quiet. <laughs> um, they did not have a good love mic in this fake hospital. But anyway, so he's like, I, I won't let you die, mom. I promise. Smash cut. Her funeral. It's, it, it's a great moment. I, I will say um, before we get any further, this is an 86 minute long movie. So it just does not screw around. It just goes for it. We are we are through the first act like two minutes into this movie and I really love that. Oh yeah, it's 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 a good time and what a so th- this movie like you said they they could afford to go to locations they filmed at three distinct locations to make this movie that are playing two distinct locations. Mm-hmm. Um, the first location is this like gorgeous n- these scenic New Mexico vistas mm-hmm. where. Every scene seems to take place in the most remote mountain location you've ever seen. Um, so he's playing soccer in the, in the remote mountains. His house is in the remote mountains. And the funeral is just on this, like, dusty red mountainside. It looks like they're on the surface of Mars. It's gorgeous. It's, it's extraordinary. I found myself watching the sequence trying to figure out, like, what in the hell? Like, we kind of sort of find out what Mark's dad does. He's he is generically in business, but, like, in a sort of international capacity. Like, how do they live? What do they do? Why do they appear to just have, like, a tumbling manse in the middle of, like, the literal, we are 500 miles from the nearest zip code quantity of just New Mexico desert? Yeah, it's like the hacienda. Like, it's just, it's, it, it's, it's, it's wild. It's beautiful. Um... I don't know why it's this gorgeous necessarily, but I loved looking at it. Oh, it's uh, it's great location work in this film. Yeah. I mean, yeah, if anyone anyone in front of or behind the camera can be considered the best person at their job, it's definitely the location scout. Easily. Like, they just knocked it the hell out of the park. Um, but anyway, his mom died. His dad has to... He is reluctant about it, but he has to finish this business thing in Japan that will basically set him and Elijah Wood up for life. Yes, if, if he goes to Japan for two weeks, they will never need money again. And it's like, what insane Yakuza deal are you getting involved with that that could possibly be true? But okay, <laughs> we'll go with it. We we get that the stakes have to be, he really doesn't want to leave Elijah Wood because Elijah was sad because the mom died. 
but it's only for two weeks and it has to it has to it has to leave him for these two weeks so everyone's sad yeah but apparently the two weeks do not start right away because they take a little old road trip up to cape cod which that i don't know take a plane it was the 90s you had planes but they, he he wants to he wants to talk to elijah wood and and so we see one scene of elijah wood playing uh, tetris on his game boy making not remotely tetris noises but that's how video games work in movies so i don't hold that against it very much um oh god and what a what a big beautiful chunky game boy he had yes um i had one of those oh, was, i had one of those it was so good i I didn't, I, uh, my first console or handheld or whatever was a Game Boy Color. Um, oh, so you, you got in rent... pretty, pretty early on though. The Game Boy Color was not too many generations into the lifespan of Game Boys. No, no, no. I was, it was a good time. I was playing the, the Pokemon games. We, you love to see it. Um, I think I rented a Game Boy from my local video store a couple times before I got my own Game Boy Color. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, so I would have been doing this. Just a couple of years after Elijah Wood is a good time. Anyway, um, yeah. So this movie's not about a Game Boy, unfortunately. <laughs> it's never it, seen it, again. It is, however, about boys' games. Oh, eh? Eh? yeah. Okay, great point. So you're right. It's so yeah. One one Game Boy is is traveling to Boston to meet another Game Boy, and this one is his cousin, played by Macaulay Culkin. He also has a character name. Henry. Uh, so that's nice. Henry, yes. Henry and Mork. Henry was easy for me to remember because the other movie about a psychopathic child that I think about a lot is The Book of Henry. So. <laughs> oh, what a movie. Um, in, in the grand tradition. Yes. But yes. Um, so yes, there's, there's an uncle who really doesn't factor into this movie as much as I thought he would after the first couple scenes. Um, and the aunt, who's much more important, uh, they are both grieving their dead middle child, who is a son who drowned in the bath, or maybe youngest child. I, I think I got know. youngest, but but it doesn't matter. He is younger than Macaulay Culkin. Yes, there is a a, a another loose Culkin floating around. We've got Quinn Culkin playing his sister. Yes. Ooh, ooh, woof. It is it um, is. I think would... telling that Quinn Culkin somehow managed to avoid being. I mean, the Culkins are actors. It's an acting family. But there's so many Culkins out there, and Quinn, Quinn didn't go past this one movie. I. It makes sense that you wouldn't. Although, um, did you see who played in the one photograph that the mother mournfully shows of the dead younger brother? Did you see who played? That was that's Rory. It was Rory, Rory, right? Yeah. Is Rory the Succession one or the Scream one? Ah. Uh... Wait, is I think Kieran is in Succession. I don't watch TV. Yeah, no, me, neither do I. Uh, uh, I just, I, 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 they are completely interchangeable in my mind. Rory was in Scream Four, and you can count on me and Signs. Got it. Okay, so Kieran Culkin is the other one, the Succession one. I would, I would be inclined to say just quickly skimming over. I think Rory is the one that I have mentally like filed as the good one. Just based on the filmography here. He's also in uh Indy yeah. Goes Down. He's in, Was he the one in Music of the Heart? He's in Mean Creek. He's not the one in Music of the Heart. That must be uh Kieran. Okay. Anyway, Music of the So two different Wes Craven movies have two different Culkins. That's uh that is interesting. It's um, a pity he was never anyway. able to, to make it a third. I know. Oh well. Get Quinn in there. What what's she up to? <laughs> <laughs> My God. Anyway, yeah. So this is a real uh Culkin family of, of of the brood is 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 on set. Oh, it's 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 a Culkin family affair. There's we'll we'll be talking about that. I am sure. Yes, yes, yes. Um, but yeah, no. Uh, just the second the second Quinn shows up, you're like, well, no, that's his real sister. That looks like Macaulay Culkin in a wig. It super um, does. It's well, wild. Also, not giving a performance that you would expect someone who was cast for any other reason than her family was already on set to give yeah um and 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 probably because she was perhaps comfortable enough with her brother to film some of the more intense sure. scenes that she has to that's film. legitimate um and anyway anyway so he meets his uh this uh, this family who lives in this gorgeous waterfront cape cod pile um oh, it is, anytime they just cut to the exterior and it's like let's just stay here we don't need a movie it's so beautiful 
Um, it's yeah. But it's, anyway, the, the bulk of this part of the movie was shot in, uh, I think, somewhere in Maine. And it's no, it's shot in Massachusetts. It's shot in Mas- Massachusetts. Okay, maybe maybe yeah. it's just that it's set in Maine. Then I don't know. Maybe it is. I I didn't look into. But definitely, I, I don't definitely them shot specifically shot saying. in a version of New England that appears to have been very carefully manicured to look the most possible like a Courier and Ives painting. Yes, very, very, very much. And then, um, yes, so the the younger brother of Henry, he is drowned in the bathtub. The, the, the mom is very dramatic about her grief. I love her, her just milking it. She loves to go off onto the, the oceanside cliff and stare off over the water like she's waiting for her, her dead son to come home from the war. Um, and that cliff, that's, that was actually shot at a cliff in Minnesota. It sure which was. was the one that right, right here in, in God's own Midwest. Mm-hmm. Um, and that also is gorgeous. But anyway, so basically, Macaulay Culkin and Elijah Wood, they're horse playing around. They're, they're doing their, 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 boy ga- their, boy ga- their boy games in the Game Boys. Um, and at first, Macaulay just seems like maybe a bad influence. It's like, oh, let's shoot a bolt gun at a cat, you know? Yep. I mean, I, I would say the first bad influence is let's smoke cigarettes. I think shoot a bolt gun at a cat is already taking us to the next level. But I don't, it is, I don't it know is how you spent your boyhood. Level. I'm not going to judge. I, I did not, but I definitely had friends who wanted to shoot things with BB guns. That's, fair. That's just like such a – it's like a classic young straight boy thing that feels like it's like if you're you're a gentle, beautiful child like Elijah Wood, you'd be like, ooh, I don't like that. But it, it doesn't feel like totally out of character for, for a child of that age to be no, doing that, shit like that. No, that tracks. I completely agree. Um, but anyway, things things get a little like more and more intense. The The, the choices that he's making – it slowly becomes clear that maybe, maybe Henry's not such a good son after he, all. He seems to uh, he seems to be overly invested in talking about death. Mm-hmm. He uh, and and perhaps visiting it upon other other creatures. Perhaps he uh, there's there's an excellent line. It's one of these small number of Macaulay Culkin line readings that I'm like willing to sign off on this movie. Uh, when they are aiming at the cat. And Elijah Wood is like, oh, oh, please, just just give the cat a warning shot or something like that. Which, okay, that's uh-huh. stupid as hell. But uh, they shoot, and it's perfect cat behavior because they shoot a bolt gun and it lands in the the post like three inches away from the cat's face. Cat doesn't even like miss a, a beat in grooming itself because cats just don't mm-hmm. give shits. Uh, yeah, it's unimpressed. And of course, Elijah Wood is like, oh, hooray, you you sure did show that cat what for, and. Uh, and Henry has some line to the effect of like, I need to fix the site. And it's such like oh, a yeah. perfectly little understated, like, oh, ho, Do, did you catch the subtext? He he was aiming for the cat and he fucked up. And uh, it's one of the few places where I think Macaulay Culkin's line reading has to be unpacked. And I liked that about it. Yeah, no, that is that that that's a good moment. Um, but anyway, you know, just a, a variety of increasingly bad things happen. They they throw a scarecrow onto the highway and cause this wild multi-car pileup. Um, it, it begins with an RV, like, flipping over because it jams on its brakes so hard. It's very exciting. Yeah, and that, that is the beginning. Yes. Uh, uh, it feels like a five-minute sequence. It's a very Final Destination too. Like, it is just going for it. Um, but anyway, so there, there's stuff like that where it's like, holy shit, this dude's actually, he's, he's, he's not cool. Uh, maybe we shouldn't be hanging out with him. And then kind of the, the crux of the movie is Macaulay Culkin. Is he going to try to kill his sister? Elijah Wood is trying to prevent this from happening, but the adults don't believe him. But also Henry is manipulating them into thinking that. Yeah. It's it's a uh, kind of combination of first Henry plays the well you were there when i killed that dog and you were there when i caused that 10 car pile up that resulted in probably a dozen human deaths uh so you can't go to the police or they will implicate you as well and this lasts for a while and then it turns into if you tell anyone i have arranged the evidence to make it look like you were the one who was causing me to do all these things oh yeah it's good it's it's very um, very very you know clear cut that kind of thing yeah it's a very clear cut. Uh, well, yeah, that's literally what you said. But yeah, it very much. It is very much that, and then that's just kind of what plays out through the end of like who's going to win this kind of battle of wits. And and at a certain point, what we realize, and we, we realize it, I think certainly before Elijah Wood does, because it's that kind of movie. 
Uh, maybe maybe when Rory Culkin drowned in the tub. Mm -hmm. Maybe it wasn't an accident. Maybe. Oh, boy. So here's the thing. I come into this kind of movie with a, a, a deep well of love for this type of movie. Um, I, I, I gather I from the way you are approaching this that you have read my letterbox review. Yes, I have read your letterbox review. Um, I have a question, yes. though. Before we dive in, have you seen The Hand That Rocks the Cradle? I have not seen The Hand That Rocks the Cradle. I have not seen Single White Female. Really? Okay. So The Hand That Rocks the Cradle is, like, the number one for me. Um, I I would be very curious to hear what your take is from that, and then I think I'd get a better temperature on how you feel about this thing um, than perhaps just one data point is giving me. Um, but uh, well, we don't have I've, that I've seen that's Poison fine. Ivy. Do we feel like that's part of the same thing? Oh, I guess, but it's definitely on a B tier of that thing. But I mean, in terms of the like lifetime movie that somehow found its way into theaters with a the cast. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. Um, did you like Poison Ivy? I did not, no. Yeah, I mean, I just don't think that you would. But see, The Hand That Rocks Cradle, that's the one that if 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 you're going to like one of these, it's probably that okay. one. Um, so I just, I just need to know, cause I want to, I want to know where we're coming from. But anyway, I, cause to me, I've seen my share of lifetime movies. I, uh, sometimes they're fun. It's, it, you know, it's like, what if exploitation had no teeth at all? <laughs> um, and then these movies, I tend to approach them as lifetime movies. And then when they do show that they have one tooth or two teeth, I'm like, holy shit, this is awesome. Okay. That's, that's fair. That's fair. I, uh, I have seen um, mm -hmm. Not Without My Daughter. That's a Lifetime, like an actual Lifetime movie, right? I think so. Okay. I have not seen that one. I think that's the um, one. Is that like the, the one that's like famous? I don't know. I Clearly clearly, this is not my I, world. <laughs> yeah, no, that's first. okay. I, I think maybe the most famous one is Mother May I Sleep With the Oh, Dangerous yes, I've seen that. That's spelling. the one I've seen, not, not the other one that I named. Got it, got it, got it. Mothers, daughters, you know, what's the difference? Um... But yeah, no, they're, they're, it, it, it can be a very good time. But yes, so Tim, Brennan, did you like this movie? No, I did not like this movie, <laughs> Brennan. I I do not want to take away the obvious delight you got in this movie. But I uh, and that's okay. You can't. I know I can't. I'm just saying. I uh, ow, I don't see what's my cat is now attacking my leg. <laughs> I. I guess I, my question is, is is it a camp thing or is it not a camp thing? Because I don't, hearing you talk, I don't think it's a camp thing. I don't think it is. I just like, I like, I just, I, I genuinely like the thing that this is doing. I, I like a domestic thriller. I like seeing a darker story from the perspective of, uh, I in the way that Lifetime does, either from a child or a woman or not just, Michael Douglas, who fucked Glenn Close, you know, and she has stabby, stabby, stabby desires. Now, now that's a movie that I've seen and I don't like as well. Yeah, I do not like Fatal Attraction either, yes. for the record. Um, although obviously that's probably the progenitor of all of this. I I think that holds because that's from eighty eight. I think. Ugh, I think it might even be eighty four. It's definitely not eighty four. I will check. It might be later than it might be earlier than eighty eight. But yeah, I um I never never enjoyed that movie. I uh, I had not seen the lifetimes, and I guess that was my question. Is like I I wasn't entirely sure how much of your affection for this was a sort of like ironic distancing thing. It sounds like the answer is very little, if any. Yeah, it's very little. I mean, I think I I like the. I mean, is it ironic to enjoy melodrama? I don't think so. I don't think it is. There's plenty of melodramas I like as melodramas. And there's plenty, yeah. plenty of melodramas I like as camp. And that's kind of why I was trying to to sort of get a sense if you... Because I, I feel like I have seen people enjoy this movie as camp. Got it. And I, I was... Because um, I, I was not seeing camp in it, I guess is the thing. But it sounds, yeah, it sounds no, like you're neither. not going to be the one who tells me where the camp lies. No, I mean, I tend to, I mean, I will approach a Lifetime movie or a Hallmark movie as camp whenever possible. Um, but I think the thing of just when that core of what Lifetime is doing gets a well-heeled production, 
um, that's automatically like, okay, like I'm, I'm invested. I'm, I'm interested in just genuinely like what's going on in this story. And then you can throw a couple moments like, cause you know, I'm, I'm an, I'm a form viewer, but I'm primarily a plot viewer and you're a form viewer. Certainly. Um, if, if we have to land in either of those buckets. Um, so if you've got three scenes that can make me go, holy shit, that just happened. I'm having a good time. And then the fact that it is, it, it, it does have a budget. It does have locations. It does have stars that are better than you would expect. I know you don't like Macaulay Culkin that much. Um, I certainly wouldn't point to him as one of the highlights of the movie per se, but he's certainly better than the average child actor. And I think Quinn Culkin's performance throws that into sharp relief. I think that is fair. Um, I would say Macaulay Culkin is very much one of the weaknesses of this film for me. Um, and I do wonder, A, how much of that is simply that Elijah Wood is just right there. And it's just real super easy to compare the two of them. And Elijah Wood's like yeah. quite good. Um, yes. And and something I had already planned on bringing this up, but now I need to credit a uh, friend of the show, Brian Fowler, who mentioned this in the comments on my Letterboxd review. So now I, now I can't steal it from him. But uh, if all you did was you swapped the two actors does the movie become better? And I feel like it does. I don't know. I think I think it does if you don't need Mark to have that emotional vulnerability. Um, but I think Elijah Wood plays that really well. Because uh, he does play Mark as like really damaged and a, a little unhinged. I also think I just, hearing you say that, I think I just figured something out in the difference between our responses. I'm not watching this as a melodrama and you are because I'm like, well, you don't need that. You don't need him to have that emotional vulnerability because that's a fake out first act. And then when you said that, I was like, oh, wait, no, for you, it's not. So that's that is the way you and I are approaching this film differently. Yeah. And 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 I understand that, like that all of that setup does get kind of shelved quite a bit in the late second act and third act, because that's just kind of how these kind of movies go. Um but I think establishing that foundation for him, both it for me, I think it helps drive the point that it's maybe a little believable that he would snap in the way that uh, Henry is trying to frame him for. Um, Cause he has some weird moments with his aunt uh, of them, like bonding over their shared grief. This is true. This is um, true. And with the psychologist that he talks to uh, where it's very clear that he's still blaming himself for his, his mother's death, like directly as if he's responsible. Um, and then there is the the little bit of a, a voiceover at the end that we get from him that I think is a really good kind of like button kind of like that just kind of punches you a little bit um, that I think wouldn't work without the rest of it. Okay. Yeah, no, and I, I'm certainly not trying to say, aha, I'm watching it wrong or aha, you're watching it wrong. And here's why. Just that it suddenly occurred to me that we are just approaching this through two different uh, generic frameworks. And honestly, that might be as much of anything that you just have a better handle on 90s domestic melodrama thrillers than i do because i I have seen apparently three and one of them is poison ivy yeah you know that that is it is what it is um and it doesn't seem like you maybe like them in general i (laughs) I mean i don't hunt them out that's the thing i don't i can't even say i mean like you said before if i haven't seen the hand that rocks the cradle do i like them we don't know but the fact yes. remains that Hand the Rocks the Cradle is a 30-year-old movie, 31-year-old now, that I have not mm-hmm. ever sat down to watch. Yeah. No, that's 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 very fair. Julianne Moore, isn't it? That's fair. Julianne Moore's never been in a bad movie, certainly not in the 1990s. Uh well. <laughs> what you gonna exactly. do? Exactly. Um anyway, and 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 look, I there are I'm I, I think that the the parts of this movie that are strong are genuinely strong, and I think they work for me in this context because I like when I'm watching a movie like this, and there are things that I enjoy in them. No, that's <laughs> you know, fair, it's and just, that's and that's just you know always... when we are watching movies, I, I I always hope to enjoy the things that are in the movie that I'm watching. I get that. Um, no, I'm I'm more for me. It's just that like it just struck me. I wasn't even really the thing that my head was going in, but it it suddenly clarified something for me. So I wanted to land on that, but yeah, I, um, I getting back to the point we were at, you know, five minutes ago, I, I do think Macaulay Culkin is a problem for this film. 
on multiple levels, but but the a problem child. Indeed, he is. Although he was not <laughs> problem child. I don't know that that did that kid grow up to be anyone. Do we know that kid's name? Is he important? Uh, let me look into that. But um, I I think sort of setting aside the question of whether we could swap Culkin and Wood, setting aside the question of whether whether Culkin is anywhere close to as good as Wood, which I I, I simply don't think he is. Um, I feel like the thing I wanted this film to be better at was well you know it's a psychopath we, we like movies about psychopaths we like movies about these characters who seem to be very ingratiating before they suddenly like they they yawn a little bit too big and we see their forked tongue and we realize that we've been watching you know some sort of hideous snake human the whole time um and i i feel like he is too much giving a flat reading that that may have been someone's strategy and maybe it was his and maybe it was the director's because he's you know 12 or 11 or however old he is at this point in time so you know he's he's a kid um but it feels like there was a strategy of if the reading is kind of neutral we'll be able to kind of kuleshov affect our way into understanding it as having been sociopathic uh but they they too often come across to me as just kind of like underbaked uh yeah no that's fair i can i can respect that like i said i i'm i'm not really interested in defending macaulay culkin's performance per se but it definitely didn't matter to okay. me as much for whatever reason it didn't didn't rankle with me okay. um and i think that might have to do with how we weight everything around him because obviously we came to this from two different approaches well, that, and that's kind of why i got excited to think about it because i was watching this as a psychopath thriller and it mm. sounds like you were ultimately you were looking for it to do other things for you. And I, I basically wanted Hannibal Lecter, but he's twelve. Yes, and that that's true. He he does not deliver a villain performance that is at that level of compelling. Not, not that I want not that I want any twelve year old child to be Anthony Hopkins, because that's a silly thing to want. But that is sort of the the thing that the movie let us instead of saying Signs of the Lambs, let us say that I wanted uh I can't think of any other movie psychopaths, which well, I know is silly of me. Yeah, well, I mean, there are also there are accomplished creepy children, even if we're not talking about psychopaths. Like, I think Heather O'Rourke in Poltergeist is like sure. this ethereal presence. Um, or maybe like even um, kids where you can see like an adult mind kind of thinking. Mm. So, or like 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 their age beyond their years. Like maybe Dakota Fanning in War of the Worlds. Um where she's got that kind of like freakishly adult sensibility in those giant eyes. Sure. Um, he just doesn't have any of that. He doesn't have a spark, um, which probably you would need for the kind of movie you wanted it to be. Right. And it, it does, you know, it, it taps into the whole thing where like, I never, I haven't since 1990. Uh, I've never quite understood why Macaulay Culkin became a huge style child star. And this is partially because I have at no point in my life enjoyed watching Home Alone. And obviously that's the movie that does that. And this is, you know, this is meant to sort of in some way be like the dark mirror universe version of Home Alone. Um, and I think this movie kind of sharpened that for me because he's he's literally right there next to Elijah Wood. And even like in the 90s, when I was like a year younger than these these people when they were children, I always kind of found myself wondering why is it that that Macaulay Culkin had that like explosive and then very quick fizzling out. Like his, his effective career is only like four years long. Um, why was Macaulay Culkin the one who hit in a way that Elijah would never hit when Elijah Wood's better? I mean, sometimes the world isn't fair. I, I get that. I guess it, I and guess Elijah it comes would... down to like, I still don't fucking get home alone. It's been 34 years. I still don't get home alone. Yeah. No. And Elijah Wood did hit eventually. Um, I mean, I mean, did, did he or did he just play Frodo? No, oh, you know what? I guess you're right. Um, but Elijah Wood, I think, has done. He and Daniel Radcliffe, I think, have done similar. Have had similar trajectories post their big fantasy mm. role, mm-hmm. um, which is that you're not always gonna like what they're making in their adult roles, but it's always something interesting. Oh yeah, no, I mean, Wood makes good choices. 
And I mean, Culkin yes. made a good choice. He decided he had ten trillion dollars from Home Alone, and he was going to retire. Yeah, no, that that does seem like the right choice. But no, I, I I couldn't explain it. I haven't seen Home Alone since I was a child. It was never a movie that meant that much to me, so I couldn't couldn't speak to his his phenomenon that much. Um, honestly, I saw Home Alone three way more because that's the DVD that we okay. owned. R- remind me, uh, if if you don't mind, what year were you born? Ninety four. Ninety four. Because I knew it was in the nineties. Okay. Not that it matters. I just was sort of curious about how this all slots into the the timeline here. Yeah, because Home Alone came out in ninety, right? Yeah, so that would have been November, like Thanksgiving of nineteen ninety. Yeah, so I I, I I was not uh first in line at the theaters to see Home Alone. <laughs> I, I cannot imagine so, no. No. Um oh and for the record, I did look up who Problem Child is. He definitely fizzled out. His name is Michael Oliver. His final role is in uh the nineteen ninety six uh Arnold Schwarzenegger movie Eraser as it's uncredited as a Russian teen. Okay. Well, at least he, he continued acting post-puberty, so that's something. Yeah. Congrats to him. Um, but yeah, no, I, I couldn't explain Macaulay Culkin any more than, than you could. Uh, obviously, the, uh, the, the, the lesser Culkins, uh, or as we would have thought of them in the 90s, have certainly come to eclipse him. I mean, him. R- Rory's a good actor. Kieran, yeah, but Rory's a good actor. Yeah, for sure. Um. But anyway, so, there, but I was going to say there are things that I do recognize just as unequivocally bad about this movie. Uh, 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 one of which you did mention in your letterbox review, which is the opening credits font. Jesus God what the damn fuck? It's the literal font from Full House. It's the straight up Full is House. It? I mean, maybe not literally. But okay, well, it just, it, it looks like the font that comes with the program. Like, it is it's just like a sort of, so bland like, and nothing. It's like one of the fun handwriting. It's It's font name is like paintbrush or something like that but it's it's not like a cursive it's more just like sort of like it's just loopy. loopy it's got some it's got a little loopy it's kind of kind of drippy looking vaguely it's a fun friendly looking kind of typeface and uh you'd see it on a church newsletter exactly exactly and it's just such a it's such a weird way to kick off anything that this film is doing, whether we're talking about it as a melodrama, whether we're talking about it as a psychopath thriller. Uh, neither one of them are suited to that. No, no, they're not. And that might have actually been one reason why I enjoyed the movie so much is that I was really set up for, holy shit, this is going to be terrible and then i see a beautiful new mexico vista and i was like oh okay, wow this is beautiful after after looking <laughs> at garbage for a minute um because it's also just super boring it's just white text on black yeah it's like the friday the 13th credit sequences yeah. where it's just like spooky music plays and you're just mm-hmm. it's just nothing um but yeah so no that does genuinely suck that was that was a weird choice um and I have a less of an issue with it than you do, but that score is messy. That score. What movie was Elmer Bernstein scoring? Do you think? Because it wasn't this one. It was Jerry Goldsmith, right? I think it was Elmer Bernstein. Oh, okay. Um, I might have. If it were Jerry Goldsmith, I'd be coming up with some sort of half-assed defense of it. Well, I I, I will double check on that, but you're almost definitely right, and. Those names are nothing alike, but my brain could it, very it's easily Elmer have swapped it's them. Elmer. Well, great. Congrats to him. Um, oops. <laughs> I mean, I I guess those people are all interchangeable. Huh? What composers? Anti-Semitism joke. Oh, are they Jewish? Okay. <laughs> I so see. Here's the thing. Um, I'm a little bit Jewish. I have a Jewish last name. My last name is Klein. Um, but the the judaism aspect of my parentage is two grandfathers so it never passed down to me properly right um or culturally um and so i don't there's there's a lot of names that are like obviously jewish that i just don't think of as jewish because i'm like well i'm not really jewish so it, i and i mean to be fair it just I, doesn't i don't, doesn't I don't know that me. either one of them was practicing i just know that if i hear that a man's name is elmer bernstein i'm going to make some assumptions about his heritage yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, but anyway, uh, regardless of his 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 parentage or his birth or his I, religion, I don't even dislike Elmer score... Bernstein. I think he's made many good scores. I don't think this is one of them. No, I I don't know anyone who would argue in its favor. It's it's certainly it's a little over the top. Uh, it doesn't quite know what movie it's in. 
Uh, it's just wrong very often. The the vibe I got from the opening credits and the music, both being such early signposts for what this film was going to be, it felt like it wanted to trick us. Like it wanted to be, you think this is going to be a family movie that's like pleasant and has Macaulay Culkin in it, but it's actually about murder. And like, that's, mm. that's a game I think a movie can play. The problem is that the score is not playing that game right. Cause it's not, it's not playing the game of this is actually a sensitive heartfelt drama about a, a young man trying to survive the death of his mother. It's, it's literally like Elijah Wood has a treasure map and he's going to go to rural Connecticut and find it with his buddy Macaulay. And it's, it's not anything that happens in this film. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I just, it's just, it just simply is, is, is wrong. I, I don't know that I got the sense either from the font or the score that that's what they were trying to do. But again, it's the different, different context that we were approaching the movie. Um, but also I don't, I tend to give short shrift to movies where I know what they're doing and they're pretending to be something else for a while where, I mean, this is a bad example. Cause I think the beginning of the exorcist is really good, but it's like, I know I'm going into the exorcist and there's going to be an exorcist. And so I'm not necessarily paying that much attention to the credibility of the other genre that they're kind of toying with necessarily. I, I feel like you picked a specifically unfortunate example because it's like, yeah, but that's where all the Ellen Burstyn performance is. And that's like the best thing in that movie. No. Yeah. But, but I'm just, I'm just saying for, me, mean, would, for me, it would that... be like the opening of the Terminator Two, the Terminator two. Sorry. Is that just like Ed Furlong just doing teen stuff? No, it's like, I don't... it's it's the one where it's it starts by pretending that it's a movie where ter- the Terminator's a villain, mm, and then about okay. twenty minutes in, it's like actually no, now the Terminator's the good guy, and like that was such a completely that didn't happen because the ad campaign spoiled it, but like it's that kind of fake out or the one I talked about on Letterboxd was that red eye where like the opening couple scenes are like, is this going to be a sort of meet cute romantic drama? No, it's not. He's trying to kill her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I guess if, if it sells it better then I guess I do enjoy that, but I I don't tend to worry about if it's necessarily working or not all the time. Um, I don't know. I have to, I have to think about that because there are versions of that that I like. Like I really like the, uh, the screwball comedy that the birds is for one act before everything goes. I mean, I, I like the opening of red eye for that matter. Oh yeah. Oh, red eye is such a good movie. movie. Um, but yeah, anyway, so no, but yeah, there's stuff in this movie that just doesn't work and I, I I recognized it, but I just, it it was weighted less for me. Is there, is there anything else that like really stands out to you? We talked about Macaulay. We talked about the score the font. Is there anything else that like feels like it's not going right? Um, I mean, I think just in general, it's, it's just not working for me. I don't think it's, it's like a catastrophe outside of the musical score. Although I do think the score is an actual catastrophe. I think that wood is good enough that, Culkin's shortcomings don't feel fatal. I mean, I gave this movie two stars. I don't hate this movie. Like hate goes, yeah. hate is like a one or one and a half star. Uh, I think it's just, it's not working. It's not working for me as a thriller. It would work better for me as a thriller if it did have, I think a better performance than the one Macaulay Culkin gives. Yes. Um, I will say though, I think, uh, like you, you obviously talked about the like the site's not right. I think there is at least one other moment where Macaulay is like doing something that at least creeped me out. There's the part where there's a a barking dog on one side of a locked gate, and Macaulay is like getting right up in the dog's face and barking back at it. Um, that scene weirded me out. Like I think that was effective to me at least. I had one other example, and I can't remember what it was now. And it was it was the same thing as like the thing with the the site where he delivers a line in a way that has two separate meanings and we understand one and Elijah Wood understands the other and I can't think of what that moment was but it it was a moment where it felt like he was kind of giving us that level of ambiguity that we could we could read it that way but I I don't remember but I I would also agree I, I had a couple other moments in his performance that I thought worked. Um, if I if I'm going to to sort of switch gears and talk about the things where I think the kind of movie kind of did work, sure. um, because again, since I was basically just watching this movie differently than you, uh, I was kind of hunting for like, is this movie going to at least become 
like campy trash will i at least be able to to latch onto it on that level and i think the scene where he tries to kill his sister by like forcing her to skate too hard basically Uh uh-huh was slightly hilarious and i did really enjoy it yeah i mean look anytime in a movie like a kid falls under the ice it is a little funny even though that's a horrible thought in real life um but it's just one of those things that on screen just never really plays scary it's not scary i think in this particular case and you know she's retired so it's it's mean to start picking on quinn culkin i think she's like she's having such a hard time like acting like she takes this seriously in a way like she seems so unruffled <laughs> by anything that yeah. happens to her in this film and i think that's part of what makes the the scene kind of silly as well yeah and then she, she's basically out of the movie for the rest of it which is for, for the better it is it is um but yeah no that that scene is a little goofy she does act like she's been given tranquilizers a little bit um but one thing, aside from that scene, one thing I wanted to point out that I think works on a level outside of how either of the main two actors is doing. Anytime there's a, a, a stunt or like there's a, we didn't mention there's this big super high tree house that a, like Elijah Wood is like hanging off from the uh, the ladder mm-hmm. and Macaulay Culkin's holding on to him. There's there's obviously some stunts, fall stunts with the cliff. There's uh, I, cliff I will say the tree house bit where he says do you think if i let go of you you would fly or something like that oh yeah yeah i was expecting that to get a call back and i was expecting to be like that was a pretty good call back and it didn't get a call back yeah no and and, and not a not a call back and also not a payoff because like because i i knew that the movie ended spoiler alert with someone falling to well it ended with macaulay culkin falling to his death death off a cliff uh so i figured there'd be some sort of like that during the penultimate scene, during the like cliffhanger, as it were, uh, and I was a little let down. Yeah, that's that is that is definitely a letdown, and also the fact that the movie could have been a little more murdery than it is. I don't think Macaulay Culkin actually kills a human being in this movie, other than I mean, his... surely someone dies in the car accident. No, in the uh, television news broadcast about the car accident, they specifically say that no one has died, but multiple people are injured. Oh, okay, I missed that. Um, there is uh, it, just, it needs to be a little more murdery obviously they have the they have him kill a dog because in these movies that's you gotta kill an animal and, some and they very carefully like arrange it for that to be like the first death where we don't entirely feel bad about it because the dog was was nasty it was menacing them earlier yeah so yeah but so, you know. so like I was expecting an escalation from the dog for sure yeah so that was a huge missed opportunity for this movie um, I do like the reveal that, um, or the the implication that he killed his little brother because the little brother got the rubber ducky hand me down. He's like, it's mine, and so he just drowns his little brother. <laughs> um, that is a, a good like child sociopath reasoning for for killing your own sibling. Um, but anyway, what I was talking about with like those stuntier scenes like there is a sense that these it there's like a very milo and otis vibe of like these kids are in fucking danger in this movie like there 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 is a sort of damocles hanging over their heads in these stunts that are very practical and seem very in camera for the most part it is shocking to Mm -hmm. watch no it's it's quite good stunt work i was actually reading up on a little bit uh because of how good it is and you know kudos that's all there's to say like they they had all the necessary safety precautions had been taken yes yes no they they were safe but it feels dangerous Absolutely. which is what the best stunts exactly. look like exactly um there is an obvious disgusting uh macaulay culkin wig on a stunt double in one of the cliffside fights where i'm like that's not the color <laughs> of his hair. that's like you put a broom on your head um but they really did shoot Macaulay Culkin falling off that cliff. They did a 30-foot drop on a cable with Macaulay Culkin to get that shot. And it just you see it and you feel it. And I think that that's very Absolutely. Important. Absolutely. And I was uh, especially like the scene where I didn't, I didn't find information on this, but the scene where Elijah Wood is hanging from the top of that really high treehouse, that looked real too. Like I imagine they had him – 
harnessed like via a fake Macaulay Culkin hand or something. something yeah. But it looks like he was probably actually hanging like 30 feet over the ground. No, it's it's the stunt work is great for sure. Yeah, uh and 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 that just that serviced a lot of the like holy shit moments in in this movie for me. There's a lot of plot stuff going on that I think really does pack a punch even though they they pull that punch on the murder, but the the genuine peril that Elijah Wood is in, that Macaulay Culkin is in at certain points, I think it really works. Um, there's a part where Elijah Wood is holding a pair of scissors to Macaulay Culkin's neck and that's, you just feel the weight yes. of those scissors. It's, yes. it's, yeah. No, it's good stuff. Uh, like that. Yeah. It, it's just, yeah, yeah. The sorry. effects work is good. Like there, there's, it is the one thing I'm absolutely willing to go to bat for this film. Yeah, no, I, I, I and I think it just works. I, I, it really worked for me. All of that uh, really worked. The just unrepentantly gorgeous locations of every scene of this mm. movie um it just it didn't need to be there but it was nice that it was i just it's such a fun movie to look at i don't think it's necessarily visually doing anything beyond presenting you with those things yeah i mean but... i would even go so far as to say i think the cinematography is kind of bad although that's as much just because this is what movies from 1993 looked like unless they were consciously trying not to but it, it's yeah. it's a very brown movie. But yeah, that, that, but the, that, that the, the locations are still great. There's there's no question that locations are great. The uh, the cliff overlooking Lake Superior that is kind of like the most crucial location maybe in the movie because of sort of how it's worked into the narrative. They just they picked a good cliff and they picked a good lake that pretends to be an ocean. Oh yeah uh it's 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 all good stuff and then macaulay culkin just gets thrown right into it by his own mother what what a choice that they made to have that happen uh you know obviously that's plot stuff and that that that's whatever but that that was the boldest choice the movie made was her having to make that decision sure although i i guess for me by the time and again i knew that this movie ended with macaulay culkin dying but like Uh it felt like that choice was already made by the movie and we were just kind of waiting for the characters to catch up with the choice a little bit but you know i can see where it would be upsetting maybe i, I, I mean i, I would I, not I, want to have to make that choice no certainly not although if you were just choosing between elijah wood and macaulay culkin i think we know which one I, you choose. I, I would give macaulay culkin a little shove just just on, <laughs> on principle mm-hmm. um but yeah no i uh i did not know specifically i didn't know anything about how this movie ended knowing how these movies work i could assume that macaulay culkin dies or is neutralized in some way like that that wasn't a surprise to me um but i did not know where this movie was heading as an ending and i think it did i think that choice played better for me because of that that's fair that's fair um so i mean i i did know that it involved a cliff and macaulay culkin falling down it i also feel like this is another one of those points where I do actually think that that Culkin's performance is a liability. He attempts to manipulate his mother by telling her over and over again, like, I love you and help me and things of that nature. And, and he's not doing it well. Like, it's just, I, I don't (laughs) believe that he's actually trying to prey on her motherly sympathies. He's more just kind of like blandly reciting these lies to his mother. Mm Mm-hmm that he's done so many times. Yeah, I don't know. I I I agree. I don't think that like whatever works to whatever works for you in the character is fine, but yeah, he he wasn't really delivering necessarily. Uh but yeah, I, uh, I just I really like this movie. I'm I think glad you did. if 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 I didn't have my kind of preconceived notions or my biases about this subgenre going into it, I think I still would have given it like a seven out of ten as opposed to an eight out of ten. Like this is just a, a type of like it just I don't know. I had a good time, um, and I hope anyone who watches it has a good time, except for Tim. Oh, so th- I, <laughs> I don't. That was that was bad. I don't know why I said that. Um, anyway, you. You are the good I, podcast. Co-host. I was gonna say I will. I will take comfort in the knowledge that history is on my side with this particular movie. 
Uh, in what you, way? You, that you, has kind of been buried and forgotten. You are fighting the current of opinion on this movie, I would say. Oh, people think it's bad. Pe- in people general. in general think it's bad. Has been my, my Interesting. impression. Well, people think Late Night with the Devil is really, really good. And I got a, I got news for you, I folks. haven't seen it, and who's to say when I will? So, Yeah, no, see, I feel like... I don't know what your reaction will be to that movie, but I knew what your reaction would be to Skinnamarink and that you would love it, and you did. Uh, I did. And I, I think you will see through Late Night with the Devil. Okay. Uh, I, it's just not. It's just not. Delivering. Honestly, other than that, it has that title and that the studio fashioned a cute opening weekend box office figure for it. I don't know a thing about that movie. Yeah. No. Uh. That's no. That's fair. Um. It's just like in in my line of work at at Screen Rant, like it's kind of blowing up. Like actual, you know, like Gen Pop are reading articles about Late Night with the Devil. Um, it's doing surprisingly well at the box office. So like, I was very curious about why, and I am still curious <laughs> after having seen the movie. Sure. Um, but anyway. Did we talk about The Good Son? Or are we done? I, I have nothing else to say about The Good Son, for sure. I guess we should note that it was based on a novel by Ian McEwan, not, who wrote Not Atonement. based on. Apparently, he wrote the screenplay directly. Uh, and actually, that is something we didn't talk about. Uh, so he wrote the screenplay, and it was meant to be a kind of like very moody, low-budget, low box office, but sort of thoughtful creepy challenges your preconceptions about children in movie sort of thing. Um, and apparently that survived up until Macaulay Culkin got cast and then Culkin incorporated sort of transmogrified it into a, into a very carefully managed Macaulay Culkin brand exercise. Yep. Uh, basically all the trivia is like, well, this person was attached, but Macaulay Culkin's dad graded with them and they left and and that's just kind of like there's so much mention of mr Mr. yeah and McEwen has like specifically said this was not the movie i wrote and it's his fault basically (laughs) yeah no that makes sense i i certainly am not inclined to trust the instincts of a stage dad like a a stage dad who was himself i did not realize this not merely like a a, an actor who, who failed like he had a career and then he stopped having a career i did not know that yeah he apparently had like a small career. Well, so did so did your boy. Uh, the other boys are still going. Exactly. Anyway, it's a very, yeah. I just, I feel like I could have, without knowing anything, could have been like Macaulay Culkin's dad. Probably not a not a good buddy. Probably not. Um, but yeah. Anyway, that's that's this movie. I did enjoy it in spite of in spite of everything. Obviously. Uh. You know, thanks for listening. We're going to go a completely different direction in Evil slash Killer Kids Month next. Uh, you can catch us in two weeks. We are returning to the the beautiful, loving embrace of the slasher genre of the 1980s. Been, been um, some while since we've done an 80s slasher track. It really has. I think, well, because both of us, that is kind of a core competency to the point that I think we try to avoid overdoing it. Uh, but yeah, it's been a while. Uh, it was time, and we 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 get to pluck a a a, a film from the the primo year of nineteen eighty one that Tim has not seen, which I'm very excited about. Uh, it is called Bloody Birthday, and we're gonna we're gonna be chatting that one up in two weeks. I I can't wait to do that. I'm I'm excited. Eighty one's a good year for multiple reasons. So. Yes, uh, I I know several of them. Uh, and it, well, that was that was nothing. I, was say, that I, was, I, uh, I know two. It had good slasher movies, and I was born in it. So I don't know. Th- those those were the two. Um. Anyway, thank you so much for listening. Have a, have you know have have a day. I hope I hope it's a good one. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Uh, I, yeah. Thank you. Bye bye.